Tuck Everlasting, written by Natalie Babbitt. Welcome, warrior friends. Today I want to share with you one of my favorite fantasies, Tuck Everlasting. We're going to begin with a prologue. The first week of August hangs at the very top of the summer, the top of a long-lived year. Like the highest point of a Ferris wheel when it pauses in its turning. The week that came before, weeks that came before, are only a climb from the balmy spring, and those that follow are the drop into the chill of autumn. But the first week of August is motionless and hot. It's a curiously silent, too, with a blank white dawn and a glorious moons and the sunset smeared with too much color. Often at night there's lightning, but it quivers all alone. There's no thunder and no relieving rain. There are strange and breathless days, the dog days, where people are led to do things they are sure to be sorry for later. One day at that time, not so very long ago, three things happened, and at first they appeared to be, there appeared to be no connection between them. At dawn, May Tuck had set out on her horse for the woods at the edge of the village of Tree Gap. She was going there, as she did once every ten years, to meet her two sons, Miles and Jesse. At noontime, noontime, Winnie Foster, whose family owned the Tree Gap Woods, had lost her patience, and at last she decided to think about running away. And at sunset, a stranger appeared at the Foster's gate. He was looking for someone, but he didn't say who. No connection, would you agree? But things can come together in strange ways. The wood was at the center, the hub of the wheel. All wheels must have a hub. A Ferris wheel has one. As the sun is the hub of the, wheel, of the wheeling calendar, fixed points they are, and best left undisturbed. For without them, nothing holds together. But sometimes people find this out too late. Chapter 1 the road that led to Tree Gap had been trod out long before by a herd of cattle who were, to say the least, relaxed. It wandered along in curves and easy angles, and it swayed off and up into a pleasant tangle at the top of a small hill, and then it ambled down again between the fringes of a bee-hung clover, and then it cut sideways across the meadow. Here its edges blurred. It widened out, and it seemed to pause, suggesting a tranquil bovine picnic, slow chewing and thoughtful contemplation of the infinite. And then it went on again and came at last to the wood. But upon reaching the shadows of the trees, it veered sharply and swung out into a wide arc, as if, for the first time, it had no reason to think where it was going, and it paused around. On the other side of the wood, the sense of easiness dissolved. The road no longer belonged to the cows. It became instead, and rather abruptly, the property of people. And all at once, the sun uncomfortably hot, the dust oppressive and the meager grass along its edges, somewhat ragged and forlorn. On the left side, the first house, a square and solid, solid cottage with a touch-me-not appearance. It's surrounded by grass cut painfully to the quick, and it was enclosed by a cabled iron fence some four feet high, which clearly said, move on, we don't want you here. So the road went ambly by and made its way past cottages more and more frequent, but less and less forbidding, and then into the village. But the village doesn't matter except for the jailhouse and the gallows. The first house is only important. The first house, the road, and the woods. There was something strange about the woods. If the look of the first house suggested that you better pass it by, so did the look of the woods, but for quite a different reason. The house was so proud of itself that you wanted to make a lot of noise as you passed by and maybe even throw a rock or two. But the wood had a sleepy, otherworldly appearance that made you want to speak in whispers. This, at least, is what the cows must have thought. Let it keep its peace. We won't disturb it. Whether the people felt that way about the wood or not is difficult to say. 
There were some, perhaps, who did, but for the most part, the people that followed the road around the wood because that was the way that it led. There was no road through the woods. And anyway, for the people, there was no other reason to leave the woods to itself. It belonged to the Fosters, the owners of the Touch-Me-Not Cottage, and was therefore private property. In spite of the fact that it laid outside the fence and was perfectly acceptable, accessible. The ownership of the land is an odd thing when you come to think of it. How deep, after all, can it go? If a person owns a piece of land, does it own it all the way down? In an ever-narrowing dimension till it meets all the other pieces at the center of the earth? Or does ownership exist only with a th thin crust under which the friendly worms have never been, never been heard of trespassing? In any case, the woods being on top, except for the roots, of course, was owned, bud and brow, by the Fosters in the Touch-Me-Not Cottage. And if they never went there, if they never wandered in among the trees, well, that was their affair. Winnie, which was the only child of the house, never went there, though she sometimes stood inside the fence, carelessly banging a stick against the iron bars and looking at it. But she had never been curious enough about it. Nothing ever seems interesting when it belongs to you, only when it doesn't. And what is interesting anyway about a slim few acres of trees? There was only a dimless shot through with, the, through with bars of light, a great many squirrels and birds, a deep, damp mattress of leaves on the ground, and all the other things just as familiar, if not so pleasant, things like spiders and thorns and grubs. In the end, however, it was the cows who were responsible for the woods' isolation, and the cows, though some wisdom they may not, though some wisdom they may not be wise enough to know that they possessed, were very wise indeed. If they had made their way through the wood instead of around it, then people would have followed the road. The people would have noticed the giant ash tree in the center of the wood, and then in time they would have noticed the little spring that was bubbling up among its roots in spite of the pebbles that were piled to conceal it, and that they would have been and that would have been a disaster, immense, that so immense that the weary old earth owned or not, to its fiery core, would have trembled on its axis like a beetle in pain. Chapter 2 And so, at dawn, the day in the first week of August, May Tuck woke up, and she lay for a while, beaming at the cobwebs at the ceiling. At last, she said out loud, The boys will be home tomorrow. May's husband, on his back beside her, did not stir. He was still asleep, and the melancholy creases that folded his daytime face were smoothed back and slacked. He snored gently, and for a moment the corners of his mouth turned upward in a smile. Tuck almost never smiled except in sleep. May sat up in bed, and she looked at him tolerantly. The boys will be here tomorrow, she said again a little bit more loudly. Tuck, tuck twitched, and the smile vanished. He opened his eyes. Why did you have to wake me? He sighed. I was having that dream again, the good one, where we were all in heaven and never heard of Tree Gap. May sat there frowning. A great potato of a woman with a round, sensible face and calm brown eyes. It's no use having that dream she said, nothing is going to change. You tell me that every day, said Tuck, turning away from her and onto his side. Anyways, I can't help what I dream. Maybe not, said May. But all the same, you should have gotten used to things by now. Tuck groaned. I'm going back to sleep, he said. Not me, said May. I'm going to take a horse and go down to the woods to meet them. Meet who? The boys, Tuck. Our sons? I'm going to go ride down to meet them. 
Better not do that, said Tuck. I know, said May. But I just can't wait to see them. Anyways, it's ten years since I went to Tree Gap. No one will remember me. I'll ride in at sunset and just to the woods. I won't go into the village. But even if someone did see me, they wouldn't remember me. They never did before, now did they? Well, suit yourself then, said Tuck into his pillow. But I'm going back to sleep. May Tuck climbed out of bed and she began to dress. Three petticoats, a rusty brown skirt with one enormous pocket, and an old cotton jacket and a knitted shawl which she pinned across her bosom with a tarnished metal brooch. The sounds of her dressing were so familiar to Tuck that he could say without opening his eyes, You don't need that shawl in the middle of the summer. May ignored this observation and instead she said, Will you be all right? We won't be back until tomorrow. Tuck rolled over and made a rueful face at her. What in the world could possibly happen to me? That's so, said May. I keep forgetting. I don't, said Tuck. Have a nice time. And in a moment, he was asleep again. May sat on the edge of the bed and pulled on a pair of short leather boots so thin and soft with age it was a wonder that they held together. Then she stood and she took from the washstand beside the little bed a square-shaped object. It was a music box painted with roses and lilies of the valley. It was the one pretty thing that she owned, and she never went anywhere without it. Her fingers strayed to the winding key at its bottom, but glanced at the sleeping tuck, she stood, she shook her head and gave the little box a pat and dropped it into her pocket. Then, last of all, she pulled down over her ears a blue straw hat with drooping, exhausted brim. But before she put on the hat, she brushed her gray-brown hair and wound it into a bun at the back of her neck. She did this so quickly and skillfully without a single glance in the mirror. May tuck didn't need a mirror, though she had one propped up on the washstand. She knew very well what she would see in it. Her reflection had long since ceased to interest her. For May Tuck and her husband, and Miles and Jesse too, had all looked exactly the same for 87 years. If you want to know more about why the Tuck family has looked exactly the same for 87 years, I invite you to read Tuck Everlasting. It's a wonderful fantasy story.